notice and consent, the transparency paradox. Let's talk about the Unit 5 essay. Um, since apparently a lot of you were in fact induced to watch all the way till the end last time, um, I'll show you something different with handcuffs at the end of this. I'll show you how to use common objects like that to pick these open. All right, so let's do this. Obviously, So I'm going to structure this a little bit differently this time. I'm going to actually try to um, go through exactly what the sections of your paper should be. Um, again, I'm not going to go into detail with all the things that you actually need to talk about. That sort of stuff is in the lecture notes and in the, the papers that I'm asking you to read. But I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here because, well, I don't want to bombard you with 10,000 different videos explaining all the different things. I know you guys have a lot on your plates right now, so let's start. Okay, obviously the first thing you have to do when you are starting writing a paper like this, or any paper, or an email even, uh, or any kind of memo, is tell the reader why they care, right? This is my usual lesson to you. The first question you should ask when you're reading something is why the fill in the blank do I care, right? And that is the thing that your reader will be asking. So right up front, you want to just start off with, hey, here's what the problem is that we're talking about. So dealing with people's personal data and when people actually are legitimately consenting to data use. Um, then you want to tell the reader what the plan is for the paper, right? You say, first, I'm going to talk about the notice and consent picture. Then I'm going to talk about this transparency paradox, which seems to show that the notice and consent picture doesn't work going to show that a potential problem for the transparency paradox is not actually a problem, and I'm going to actually talk about some of the lessons that we can learn from that potential problem for talking about personal data. Then go. Okay. I don't, this is what you would normally call the intro, but I don't like to talk about it that way because intros get long and they get off topic. So you want to be really short, really crisp, really clear up front. Here's what we're talking about. Here's how we're going to talk about it. Then do it. Okay, so let's talk about it. So notice and consent model. Um, the first thing you want to say is sort of what problem is this solving, right? And again, don't have to be terribly detailed, but you want to go into a little bit just so the reader understands that we're talking about a way of approaching um, how people, how a company can get the right to do stuff with people's personal data, right? And it's you want to say sort of what it is, right? We notify you and you consent to it. And you're probably going to want to talk about those in a little bit of detail. Not as much detail, obviously, as I go into in the written notes. Um, that's there to give you kind of almost as full a picture as you could possibly need. Um, but, you know, so not that much detail, but you want to say sort of here's what it is and you want to say here's why we care about it. You know, things like uh, it extends normal contract law, normal business practices to this other realm. Um, it respects people's autonomy, allows for consumer choice, all those sorts of things. You don't need to go into a lot of detail with that part of it, but you do want to just kind of make sure it's clear. Hey, here's somebody. Here's why somebody would want that because, you know, you don't want to be reading a paper that's like, this thing sucks, this thing is terrible. And, you know, somebody that doesn't know anything about it is going to be like, well, yeah, okay, fine. So why are we talking about it, right? You know, you always want to start off with why we care about it so that the reader kind of can get oriented and understand what's going on. Okay, now to the meat of it. Um, the transparency paradox. You want to say what it is. Um, it's very simple to state, although you want to be a little careful, right? So, um, you know, it's two horns, right? It's if we, uh, you know, sort of give complete information, people won't understand it, you know. And sort of understandable information will not be complete enough. Lots of different ways to put this, but that's the basic idea. That there's something about the stuff we're talking about when it comes to personal data that means that you're going to need everything. The summary is not going to work very well, right? Um, 
And that's going to be the key thing, right? Because you don't want to put this forward in a way that just looks like what Nissenbaum is saying is like, oh, you can never summarize anything because whenever you summarize stuff, you leave stuff out, right? That's trivial and not a problem. So the big thing to talk about is kind of like once you've kind of set this out in whatever you know way you want to do it, um, the big thing you want to talk about is what drives it, right? Because that, I think, is the key for uh, the understanding why this is supposed to be a problem. And there's a bunch of features to this. Again, go look at the written notes and everything else for the full picture. But there's basically lots of stuff in there like um, uh, you don't just need to know what the privacy uh, policies of the, the company that you're, say, going to the website of are. You need to know what are the privacy policies of all the companies that are going to get a look at the data that you create while you're on that website. And there's this huge network and web of interconnected data brokers, uh, companies that do data analytics, and you would need to know all of all the way down how your data is going to be treated. Um, and that right there, just with that one feature, and there's other features too, talk about in the notes, but other features too um, are going to actually drive this problem. They're going to show, you know, that when the, the way that industry works and the way that um, the sort of contracting system is constantly in flux, uh, not the contracting system, but you know, business relationships are always in flux, right? So those, fa those kind of facts are what makes the transparency paradox a real problem for the NOSA consent model. And what you want to do, I mean, it's probably going to be pretty obvious why the transparency paradox is a problem for this, but you just want to make sure you say it and summarize it really clearly and cleanly in a couple of sentences at the end of this discussion or, you know, it, somewhere in there, beginning or end or whatever. But you just want to say, you know, exactly, hey, here's what the notes and consent model says we should be doing. And here's what exactly why the transparency paradox says that that is not possible. Okay, so this is all kind of the, you know, I always think of like a, these essays when I'm designing them, you know, there's kind of the, the setup, then there's kind of the, you know, what's the background or what's the topic? And then there's the part where I ask you to do stuff, right? Where you're now supposed to be doing your independent thought um, increasingly, right? Um, and so that's now this part, right? So this is kind of the, you know, oh, you probably can't see that. So this part is the, you know, the um, explaining part. Right, you're just setting out uh, this model. You're setting out Nissenbaum's transparency paradox, and you're giving some explanation to make sure it's clear uh, what's actually going on. Then, once we get to this part, should have used a different color, but whatever. Once you get to this part, um, this is you know sort of you, right? This is you. I'm asking you to now independently think, although asking you to think about a specific thing. Um, that's the rest of the paper. Okay, so what are you supposed to be thinking about now that I've totally ruined my nice diagram? Uh, whatever. Uh, this is easier on a board. Um, at least I can erase on a board. Okay, so suppose that we, okay, so you've done all this. You've set out what the transparency paradox is, why it's a problem for this. The reader knows what that is. We're good. Now, if some imagine that you're a friend of the the transparent the um, notes and consent model, right? You're somebody that thinks, oh, we should keep this, but we need to fix it somehow. So you like you know like the nutrition model, uh, sorry, nutrition label model of how to um, how how to fix the notes and consent model. So somebody like that who's a, a friend of this uh, could look at the transparency paradox and go, well, yeah, sure. Nissenbaum's given us like a real, she has set out a real problem here. Um, but we, you know, we don't quite, let me put it this way. Um, the fact that there is a potential problem doesn't yet show you that the problem is as bad as Nissenbaum is telling you it is. So what you want to do when you face that kind of situation, you know, somebody's telling you, okay, we've got a problem, here's what it looks like, and, you know, question one is like, A, is it a real problem? And then question B is how bad is the problem, right? So now we're kind of thinking about the how bad is the problem. You could think of it this way. So you might think, what you want to do when you're approaching that is think, well, okay, what other kinds of situations have I seen a problem like this in, right? And have I been able to solve it in a different context? 
because if we've been able to solve it somewhere else, that shows, yeah, this is a problem, but maybe we can still fix up the notes and consent model and everything's going to be okay, right? So an obvious place to, to look at, to think about the, um, how this would work is medical consent, right? Because what do you have in, when you go in for a, um, a medical procedure? Well, you know, if it's, like a surgery or something, at some point the doctor or the surgeon or their staff will give you a consent form that spells out, you know, hey, you know, here's the problem that you have, right? Here's the the surgery we're going to do. So you're going to, you know, we're going to do a reduction in fixation, you know, or whatever. Um, and then they're going to say, here's what all the risks are, right? So they're going to give you a fairly summarized, nice and consolidated explanation of a very complex, in some cases, medical procedure, medical phenomenon. The risks are going to be very complicated, especially if you're going into anything like, you know, say chemotherapy, where, my God, oncology is crazy. So this is there's a complex body of knowledge that you would need to really fully understand um, what you're consenting to when it comes to medicine, right? You would in a lot of cases, to really understand what you would need to know, you would need to go to medical school. Um, so it looks like the medical case should be like the notice and consent thing, right? Where there's a complex body of knowledge, you need a lot of background and stuff like that in order to understand everything you need, need to know in order to give legitimate consent. So what you would do is first take the notice and consent, uh, sorry, the transparency paradox thing, well, sorry, first thing you would do is explain sort of what we, what's actually involved in consenting to a medical procedure, um, you know, and why it's actually gonna be complicated. And then take this, the transparency paradox, and try to explain why it sh seems like it should arise here, right? Again, this is pretty, um, this isn't, if you've done the work here in setting this out clearly, this should be really pretty trivial, right? It's just a few sentences, easy to do, but crucial that you do it because we really need to hear, okay, why is it actually seem like it's problematic? Okay, we need to know, actually understand what's going on and why it seems like this is, the transparency paradox is gonna undermine the possibility of, of uh, medical consent, okay? So once you've done that, you've s explained, yeah, okay, look, you would really, to actually know enough, you would need to go to medical school. That's just like, you know, needing to go to law school in order to consent to a privacy policy or whatever. Um, once you've got that set out, and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. Once you've got that set out, then we can talk about Nissenbaum's response, which is actually really interesting, right? She actually, in some ways, bites the bullet. Um, she says, yeah, the transparency paradox would undermine medical consent if all that was happening was the doctor was handing you the consent form and being like, okay, read that, sign that, right? She says, but that's not actually how medical consent works. And as somebody who does medical ethics, I can tell you an awful lot about, and who does clinical research with my research group, uh, where we have to set up consent forms, which, oh my God, that's way harder than I thought it would be. Um, but, you know, what we actually do in the medical arena is not just write a bunch of stuff down on a piece of paper and hand it to the patient, right? There's a whole bunch of institutions and norms and social expectations. Um, we basically expect that the doctor is there. It's their job to distill down this information for us and give us just the things we need to know. And basically for us to be able to trust their judgment. There's a, you know, because we think that the institutions of medicine and the social understandings of what a doctor is supposed to do give us confidence. In addition, we have legal institutions, we have, you know, the courts, we have all sorts of things that give us the, a framework that allows us to trust what the doctor is telling us. And that's what gives us the possibility of consenting. So Nissenbaum's view is basically that, yeah, the transparency paradox would undermine medical consent if we just did it in the way that we try to do things online, right? But what actually creates the possibility of legitimate consent is a whole framework of norms and institutions and laws and stuff like that that allows us to trust doctors and allows us to trust that what they're telling us is, you know, 
reliable and sort of the best information that we're going to have. Okay. So once you've done that, now for the last bit, which is just to ask you to think a little bit about, well, okay, so maybe Nissenbaum's right. Maybe what actually matters isn't the, you know, what information we give or how we kind of lay it out on the page, but whether there's a set of institutions or professionals that allow us to navigate the system um, and social understandings and norms that allow us to trust the kind of advice that we're getting. So you could think of a lot. So what I'm asking you to do in the last part of the question is just to think about what it might mean to translate the norms and institutions that apply in the medical case to the case of uh, consenting to the use of your personal data. So there's a lot of different ways you can go here. Um, I've seen some, frankly, excellent responses from students on questions like this on, on past exams, where I've been like, oh, <laughs> I should have thought of that. So, and you know, if you have a response like that, I will think that, and I will also shamelessly steal it. So let me mention a couple of things uh, that former business ethics students uh, have come up with in the past, and I think they're quite good, right? So one possibility, and I just love this, you know, you business students, you always see a market opportunity. I mean, it's great. Um, a bunch of students have independently come up with the idea of like, well, all right, well, maybe, you know, what we need is like personal data consultants, right? Maybe there's a, a you know, maybe what we do is we keep the notes and consent model, right? But whenever you are thinking about, you know, signing up for a new app or something, you um, have a, you know, a personal data consultant that you send the terms and conditions to and they look it over and they've already kind of know what your worries about security are, what your preferences are. And they'll come back to you and they'll be like, OK, here's, you know, you need to be aware of X, Y and Z before you sign up. And then you're like, cool, I can make a choice. Right. And there's, you know, presumably this would be an industry that has professional standards and regulations and, you know, sort of lawsuits in the background as a threat to keep everybody, you know, sort of on board. Um, and that could be the same sort of thing. It's like, you know, many hospitals have specialists who are very, you know, who are trained at explaining complex medical procedures and risks and all sorts of things like that that are necessary for medical consent um, to patients, right? There's a, there is a specialization of people who, who do that. So maybe we could just translate that over into the case of, the, um, of personal data, right? So that's one way of going, and that would work around the transparency paradox in a similar way to the way that Nissenbaum thinks we've actually worked around medical consent in the medical arena, okay? So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. I'll stop here since I don't want to overload you. Um, again, all of the stuff that you actually need, all of the details and all the background, you should be looking at the papers and the written lectures. Um, but hopefully this helps.